You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist, Chris Smith, is back with us this week, and we have just opened our lines, taking your science questions on any subject that you might have on your mind. This is your opportunity to satisfy your curiosity about the world we live in and find out more about the weird and wonderful laws of nature and the intricacies of the human body. Chris. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thank you very much. I understand you've been enjoying a nice heat wave and, uh, in some parts of the country it's been, and, yeah. and a bit of rain as well, which is, which is always welcome, isn't it? Yeah, we've been having uh, quite the heat wave here, especially in uh, Johannesburg, but um, some great thunderstorms as well just to cool us off a little bit. Yeah, best thunderstorms in the world happen in Joburg, in my experience, Definitely, <laughs> as, in, as yeah. in the most vivid. <laughs> Chris, um, the use of bionic plants to detect explosives. Tell us about that. That's very interesting. Well, scientists have been for a long time trying to come up with devices that will enable us to monitor environments and sense things and detect explosives or other chemicals and toxins. And building these sorts of devices takes time. Running them takes time. They need batteries. Well, why don't we use plants, is what Michael Strano and his colleagues from MIT wondered, because plants power themselves, they gather their energy from the sun, they have roots that go down into the soil and take out samples of water that you can analyse, and they can also be used to analyse air, because they pull in gases into their leaves, and they use them. So could you modify a plant to turn it into a detector? And what this group have published in Nature Materials this week is precisely this. They take some tiny nanotubes, these are a flat sheet of carbon atoms called graphene rolled up into a cylinder. And these are about 10,000 times smaller than each of the hairs on your head, these tubes. And you functionalise the tubes by decorating them with another chemical which enables them to bind onto whatever the substances are in the environment you want to detect. You paint a solution of these nanotubes onto uh, the leaves of your plants. In this case, they used spinach plants. And then they shine light of a certain colour onto the plant leaves while they're drinking from a source of water that contains, say, picric acid, which is a, an explosive or an explosive material that's u- used to make explosives. And this gets drawn up into the roots, goes to the leaves, the picric acid binds onto these carbon nanotubes and it changes the shape of the nanotube so that it responds differently when light shines on the leaf. And you can detect that. And they're able to show that within just minutes, your plant can pull out of the soil evidence of, say, an explosive, and you can see this from a distance away. And why this is important is you might be able to, say, grow these plants on soil contaminated by landmines. You could see where the mines were, because the explosives leaching out of the buried mine would be picked up by the plant that would change the colour of the plant leaves in, in this detectable way, and you'd know to, A, avoid that spot, and B, go and get a demining professional. Oh, well, so are you seeing more and more of that happening in terms of uh, nature, uh, a symbiosis between nature and technology being used to solve uh, a lot of uh, our our issues? Well, in a way, yes. This is called biomimetics, copying from biology. The rationale for this is that nature, Mother Nature, has had billions of years to come up with all kinds of solutions, the solutions that you see in the world around you. So rather than reinvent the wheel, why don't we see how nature has solved the problem by going through millions and millions and millions of cycles of evolution and optimization, which is what evolution effectively is. It's optimizing something to work best in that environment. And then we see how nature's done it and we build something equivalent. And that's what they're doing here. I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard about uh, the 16-year-old from South Africa, Kiara Nogan. Um, uh, she won the coveted Google Science Fair um, Community Impact Award uh, for 2016. And she, um, called, she, she created something then that she calls the combating drought with a low-cost um, uh, biodegradable super-absorbent polymer made out of orange peels and avocado skin. Um, and somehow this creates a, a reservoir, a, a reservoir, water reservoir on the earth. And that's really to try and preserve a whole lot more of the water in the most natural ways possible in times of drought. So it seems like it is, it is well, happening congratulations quite often. to her. Yeah. No, congratulations to her. It's a great idea. But the thing that binds water in soil is the organic matter. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is carbon sources and other materials that get buried into the soil, things like dead leaves. A lot of people bury their kitchen waste in their garden, as long as you don't end up attracting lots of rats, which is quite <laughs> idea. But if you bury your kitchen waste, then this is adding organic matter back into the soil. It helps to break up soil particles and exactly as you say it retains moisture which means that plants will find it easier to cope when there is a a stretch of time with no rain very very fascinating i'm not sure if you heard earlier but i am 
refer refer to you as a as a type of um, Stephen Hawking. Um, uh, we were we, we were chatting about, uh, of course, uh, you coming up earlier, and I and, and I certainly do think that you are like a, a walking, talking um, Stephen Hawking. And uh, we have a lot more questions uh, coming in for you. Um, it's the uh, open line of oh, well, bigger pardon, not the open line, but the open line for questions to you. Um, of course, if anyone wants to call, it's oh one one eight eight three oh seven oh two, or you can SMS SMS us your questions to three one seven oh two. Or if you're in the Cape, 021-446-0567 or SMS us on 31567 for your questions to Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. All right, Chris, so we already have some uh, callers coming in. Paula from Cape Town. Hi. um, This isn't a very sophisticated question, (laughs) but it's something I've been wondering about for a very long time. And um, I'm actually interested in knowing if other people also wondered about this. I'm um, sensing I'm toilet humor coming of sorts. Uh, sorry? I'm sensing a bit <laughs> of toilet humor Paula. coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, why do we want to gag when we smell someone else's fecal matter or gas, but we can tolerate our own brand? <laughs> well, Paula, I mean, the, the thing is, I, I haven't lived with you, so I, <laughs> I can't comment on your personal habits. Uh, but... Uh, the the fact is that you've got to live with yourself, haven't you? That's one point, that you don't have a choice. And when you don't have a choice, you have to put up with it. One person speculated to me that the reason we don't find our own quite so offensive... Now, I don't know if there's any scientific evidence to base, up, base what I'm going to say on. Excuse me. <clears throat> but the theory sounds reasonable, so I'll repeat it. The The suggestion from the person to me was that because you have the stuff that you're releasing into the environment around yourself inside you already it's possible that small amounts of this find its way via your bloodstream and so on to the olfactory system and they already adapt you to your own vintage or aroma so that you don't find it quite so bad or quite so startling because you've had a degree of what we call adaptation, which is the process by which the nervous system is initially very interested in something new, gets heavily stimulated and then with the persistent present of presence of a stimulus, you become less interested over time. So one suggestion I did hear, it doesn't seem so unreasonable, is that some of the chemicals that are associated with those smells are already in you, so your smell system is a bit more used to them. You are not used to, unless you live in very close contact with, um, for an, an unpleasant and extended period of time with someone else producing these sorts of effluxations, and, and therefore you will experience this as a novel stimulus that you'll find far more offensive. From an evolutionary point of view, you also there is an advantage to being repelled by things that might be bad for you now people making bad smells might be because they're ill they're rotting they're in some way not in good health they might therefore be infectious and they might therefore pass that on to you so being repulsed or sensing uh, um, the of, of experiencing the desire to be repelled by those sorts of things would be to your advantage because it will encourage you to avoid things that might infect you or or it might be able to spread contagion onto you and make you less healthy. So I think there is an evolutionary reason why we are repelled by nasty stuff. Um, and when it extends to farts, you don't find your own quite so bad because you have to live with yourself. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Welcome back. I'm Maps Mapunyani. I'm the Friday stand-in for the Radio Club Show on 702 in Cape Talk. And uh, we're currently talking to Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist. If you have any questions, uh, please make sure that you call us. We have a few questions on the phone line already. Uh, we uh, have Donovan here from Johannesburg. Donovan. How's it? How's it? How's it, Maps? How's it going, Chris? Hope you guys are well. Oh, well, thank uh, you. Chris, Hi, Donovan. Question, how's it? How's it? My, question, my, my question is regarding um, thunderstorms and swimming pools. So... Uh, can you perhaps just try and explain what happens when you go out the morning after a late night thunderstorm and your swimming pool's gone from crystal blue to pea green? Um, and then whatever whatever happens there seems to just happen instantly and it takes you another 48 or a couple of hours to get your pool back to blue again. Hi, Donovan. Yes, I've been a victim of this. Um, pools going green, as were the poor people in Rio for the Olympics, where they had a catastrophe there, didn't they? Now, the reason this happens, the greenness is algae. Algae are microscopic plants. They're single-celled plants, and because they are plants, they have the chemical chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the pigment they use to capture energy from the sun. It's what's used by other green plants. It's a green molecule. That's why they look green. 
and these single cells are loaded with it, they can grow incredibly fast. And normally you suppress the growth in your swimming pool via several mechanisms. One is you poison them with chlorine. Two, the water is pretty boring because there's not much in there for them to eat. And therefore, if there are not too many of them in there and they're being poisoned pretty quickly, they won't grow too fast. But if you fertilise your pool with things that they need to make them grow they'll grow very quickly and explosively really fast because the pool is nice and warm mm. and warm water supports rapid metabolism and that means rapid growth. When you have a thunderstorm, the high temperature of the lightning, a lightning bolt sizzles the air at uh, probably about 30,000 degrees C. It produces various oxides of nitrogen because the air is 80% nitrogen and this fixes the nitrogen from nitrogen gas which can't be used metabolically into these oxides, noxes of nitrogen, which A, are capable of dissolving in water to a limited extent and coming down in the rain, and B, are really good fertiliser. So lightning storms fertilise your pool because these microorganisms, these algae are plants, they love that nitrogen fertiliser, they grow very fast and they turn the water green. The reason it's so hard to get rid of them, they are tiny. They go straight through the filtration system and they can come back out through the sand in the filter. They also grow and reproduce incredibly fast, so they're really hard to get rid of. You need to shock treat the pool with a high dose of chlorine to kill them off, especially the ones that have become resistant to the chlorine. And then you need to add some kind of flocculating agent. Something like aluminium sulfate is often used. Um, this works because aluminium is a small, highly charged atom, which has a big positive charge, which pulls things close towards it. This turns lots of little specks of algae into a bigger clump of algae, which is easier for the filter to remove. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Freedom in Auckland Park. Ah, Chris, uh, I want to ask about the new AIDS vaccine. Well, the new AIDS vaccine that is going to kick up in South Africa, how useful it is, and then how it is uh, possible, let's say for the wife who's pregnant and is positive, but when you find her husband, the husband is negative. How does that work? For example, like where the president here was uh, 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 crazy, but he himself is positive, is negative, and then crazy was negative. So how does it work in, in, in terms of like that? Okay, so first of all, HIV, of course, a big scourge. It's a big danger. There are millions of people with this virus infection around the world. It spreads via a range of different routes. One of them is via sexual contact. It can also sp spread via needle sharing, intravenous drug use, and people having blood transfusions from contaminated blood. There's a range of ways that you can get this. The best way to protect yourself is not to put yourself in harm's way in the first place. That is the way which we know absolutely works. We know, unfortunately, that people can't always manage to do that, and as a result, that's why the search is on to try to find a vaccine. At the moment, there is no AIDS vaccine. We are looking very hard for one, and it will save millions of lives when we do find it, because today, thousands of people will become infected around the world with HIV, and today, thousands of people will die of HIV or with HIV and as a consequence of HIV. So it's a major global health priority. Now, what we can do at the moment are two things. One, we can try to stop people who've been exposed from catching the virus in the first place. And two, we can control the infection in people who already have HIV. We do the former, we stop people catching it who've been exposed by giving them big doses of antiretroviral drugs, ARVs, antiretrovirals, after they've been exposed. If this is done promptly, as in within hours of being exposed to a case of HIV, it can stop the virus gaining a toehold in the first place and a person won't catch it. This is very effective and it's called post-exposure prophylaxis. In terms of stopping people who are already infected with HIV passing it to other people, again, giving them drugs, antiretroviral drugs, which will suppress the level of HIV in the bloodstream so that that person's body fluids are at minimal infectivity, this is also very good for the person who's got HIV and it's very good at reducing the risk of them transmitting HIV. Something that's being experimented with at the moment is called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP and this is where you give people who might during the course of their day be exposed to HIV the same drug treatments or a, a, a sort of similar cocktail of drugs or in some cases 
another preparation containing some of these drugs and this means if they come into contact with HIV they're less likely to catch it. So investigators are going down all these paths while at the same time trying to discover a new vaccine or a vaccine which will protect people from HIV infection. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Chris in Centurion. Hi, Chris. Um, I'd like to know, please, when one is on a course of antibiotics, you're advised to take probiotics as well. Could you just, just explain, please, the difference between the two? Hello, Chris. Uh, this is going to get confusing, potentially, isn't it? Um, right. First of all, what is an antibiotic? Well, an antibiotic... Uh, is, is a slight misnomer because we should more accurately call these drugs antimicrobial drugs. These are agents that kill bacteria. They kill bacteria by exploiting differences in the way bacteria work compared to a human cell. And so our cells either don't take up these agents or they don't have the right target for the drug in them, so they don't harm our cells. But bacterial cells, which are a different type of cell entirely, take in the molecule and they are destroyed by it, hopefully. Now, the problem is that your body is full of microbes, your flora. These are your friends, and in fact, they outnumber you probably 10, 20, maybe even 100 to 1. There are kilograms of bacteria living in your guts. Your face has hundreds of millions of microbes living per centimetre of skin in certain places. They help you and keep you healthy, and they do this by providing you with various chemicals that you can't make yourself. They also take up space and they keep the bad guys out, so bugs that are bad for you can't grow there. Unfortunately, antibiotics cannot discriminate between those good guys and the bad guy who's the bad bacterium which has got into you and is now causing an infection. So when you take a course of antibiotics, you are harming the bad guys, but you are also hurting your friends. And one of the reasons why people feel bad when they've had an infection, had some antibiotics, and they might get some side effects like diarrhea or not feeling quite right for a while, is that it takes some time for your natural fingerprint spectrum of good bacteria to recover itself and grow back to what it was before. And while it's not right, you don't feel right. And so some people advocate taking some probiotics, which are sources of the sorts of bacteria which live in you, in order to bring your levels back to normal. Another way of doing this is to have what's called a prebiotic effect, where you take various foodstuffs and other nutrients, which helps to select for the growth of the good bacteria and it suppresses the growth of the bad bacteria. And in both cases, you hopefully restore your good bacterial friends back to their normal thriving populations, which is con consistent with good health, and you keep out the bad guys. All right, quite an intricate answer, that one. A uh, lot to think about, and I could see what you meant by you had a lot to get through to really get that one out there, Chris. Um, I hope that answers your question, though, Chris and Centurion. Uh, Titus and Brackpan, thank you so much for holding. Hello, are you? Good and you. All right, man. I want to ask Chris then two questions. One is about the air. When you take a flight to Durban, when you're in the air, it seems like the airplane moving very, very slow. What causes it? And the, the, the second question is, after washing and bathing and putting in uh, on uh, some, 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 some nice smelling bath soap, after washing yourself, you, you still stink. What causes the problem? <laughs> okay, well, the aeroplane one is a sense of perspective. When you're on the ground taking off, then the aeroplane is moving along the runway and the things you're looking at are very close to you and therefore the distances are small and relative to the things like the buildings next to you, the amount you're moving is very large. So you seem to be going very quickly. Once you are up in the air at cruising altitude, you're at thousands of feet away from those buildings and other structures. They are much smaller to you because they are further away and therefore relative to them it doesn't look like you're travelling as fast because the distance away from from them is so much greater so relative to them the amount of distance you're traveling as you fly along is smaller so therefore your perspective is that you're not going as fast in fact you are you're doing a much greater speed when you're at cruising altitude you're doing say um, something like 800 kilometers an hour now with respect to the smelling question the answer is that the reason something smells is because the smelly stuff is producing molecules 
volatile molecules which come off of you usually in response to your body temperature and also because a bit of sweat and as those things evaporate they come off of your body surface they go into the air and they form a cloud around you of these molecules which when someone else walks into that cloud and breathes it up their nose they smell it and because it stimulates the nerve cells at the top of their nose and they experience the smell of you but you are, if you can imagine, throwing this cloud of molecules into the air around yourself all the time, eventually you're going to run out of the source that's making that cloud of molecules. And that's why the smell starts very strong, and then after a, a little while in some cases, longer in other cases, the smell has worn off because the molecules have all evaporated from your skin. There's nothing left to produce more of that smell. And then you have to either go and have another bath with some more bath salts, or you have to go and put some more of your aftershave on to make yourself smell nice. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that was uh, a pleasure. Unfortunately, we've run out of uh, time once again, but um, yeah, I guess it is uh, all comes down to perspective. I was thinking about that first one, and what made me laugh there was that why when you're on your way to Durban, but I'm pretty sure it's on your way to anywhere, just when you're in the plane at all. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for being as uh, as informative as always, and uh, of course, Thanks, uh, you'll be back again next week. I'll see you next week. All right. Well, not me, but yes. <laughs> All right, cheers. Well, I won't see you, but uh, hopefully, <laughs> well, hopefully I will one day. But uh, I'll see whoever's sitting there in the chair on Friday next week. All right, thank you very much. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist.